So good morning, everybody. A warm uh, welcome to this event, so organized by uh, Future Lab uh, Europe. Um, so my name is uh, Claire Deré, so it's a great pleasure for me to uh, be with you today to uh, lead this program on Future Lab Europe and to uh, chair um, this event. Um, so m some of you might uh, wonder what uh, Future Lab Europe is about. Um, some of you know already what the program is about, but some don't. So uh, who we are, who is um, Future Lab Europe? So it's a program for uh, young people aiming um, really to uh, foster debate on uh, EU policies among the young generation, but also to bridge the gap between young people and uh, policymakers, in particular policymakers at the uh, EU level. So the reason we are here today is that um, the Future Lab has so prepared a great presentation on the uh, future of democracy uh, in Europe. Um, as part of um, this um, publication, so there are uh, a set of policy recommendations addressed to um, policymakers at uh, the EU level on how to move towards uh, a democratic system where the citizens are really placed at the center of the decision making uh, process. So in preparation to this uh, to this event and uh, as part of the work, uh, the preparatory work we had for the publication, um, the Future Labels uh, launched a, a social media campaign who started some uh, weeks um, ago. Um, so some examples are, are displayed uh, here on the screen. So using the hashtag I participate and also stating, um, <coughs> stating uh, why they think that it's important to participate in, in uh, democracy. As part of this campaign, we also had um, a manifesto uh, which has been translated in uh, several languages, so in 11 um, languages. And uh, as a result of these campaigns, so we see that there are some, uh, some clear messages uh, emerging from, from that. So first, that um, so young people really want to uh, shape the future of Europe. They also think that it's important to participate to protect uh, fundamental, uh, fundamental rights. Um, but they want also to make their voice uh, heard and they want to hold politicians uh, accountable. Um, and last but not least, uh, they think that it's important to influence the nature of uh, policy making, both at uh, the European but also the, the, the national uh, level. So without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, thank our speakers uh, for uh, joining us uh, today. So Antonio Silva Mendes, who is um, director at DG IAC, so education and culture, working on uh, youth and uh, sport policies. And uh, Sven Gigor, who is a member of the uh, European Parliament, um, so representing the, the Green uh, uh, Party and who has been also very active in uh, grassroots movement but, and also a strong supporter of the European Citizens uh, Initiative. Now I would like to uh, also give um, the floor to start um, the debate by giving the floor to um, our uh, future lab, so Ivo Vizak, who will present you the main uh, messages and the main ideas of, of our publication. Um, so, Ivo, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, I hope all of you hear me. And uh, first of all, I have to apologize for a few coughs that might come up uh, during this uh, short uh, overview because I managed to catch a flu. Although I come from the very north of Europe, from Estonia, it's, yeah, you can still manage to catch a flu in Brussels also. So, Tere Hommikus Kallikülalised, good morning, dear guests, policymakers here in Brussels, friends and fellow future labbers. Uh, my name is Iva Visak, and I will be presenting you the general overview of our, of our new publication that has come out just now. Um, what started as a project for common market for steel and coal has become pretty much a platform where politics has completely lost the Hobbesian ideas of the past. 
and where cooperation and magnitude of levels is being tried out and implemented. The continent that was burdened by continuous wars now manages to agree on the free movement of people, as in me being here, goods and services and work together on a variety of policy areas, where old enemies don't remember the name enemy and see each other as partners. In the backdrop, however, European Union has been and is in a constant turmoil of national and international conflicts, and where very often direct, urgent response from European Union is needed. What we get is nothing new. European citizens witness dysfunction and stagnation based on status quo complacency. The dead circle creating more distrust into the functionality of the whole system, creating logically less support for the European project. EU-friendly national governments are being threatened by straight-out anti-EU political forces nowadays almost everywhere. They're in Estonia, they're in Finland, they're in... I don't know if they are in Sweden, maybe. Uh, yeah, I think they are. On top of that, the last EU elections in May 2014 had the lowest ever turnout rate. The youngest of Europeans, often perceived as the most EU-friendly of all the generations, had an electoral participation 30% below that of older voters. Europeans, regardless of age, do not bother to vote, and when they do, it is increasingly to protest against the status quo or the current European affairs. The Brexit, the Brexit, and for example, again, in Estonia's case, if it should ever come to that, it would literally be the exit. So, better check yourself before you wreck yourself are words uttered by an American gangster rapper Ice Cube, but are nothing more than a correct in the current situation. The sense of urgency has to take over not only us in this room, but everyone in the European Union who value the idea of common European policy making. The EU is operating in less and less stable economic and geopolitical environment, most ap apparent in the continuing Russian violations of international law, and the possibility of a permanent pressure of a large-scale exodus towards Europe. What we had in front of us is an impossible task to solve all the problems. However, uh, this publication concentrates on the actions which are seen by the future labors as the one requiring the most of our attention. The recommendations can be put into two categories. Ones that see on how to increase the democratic legitimacy of the EU itself, and secondly, on how to bring back the citizens to democratic participation for a citizen-led Europe. So this publication contains five chapters and is written by five different future labors. Andras Varga discusses on how, where is Andras, by the way? Andras. Andras Varga discusses on how we have to change the very core of European political culture, culture which is nothing else but a set of tools, habits, methods, beliefs, and attitudes towards and regarding politics. The culture that is present at the national level today is the culture of political conflict and the political culture of Europe is very much the direct opposite of this, that tries to integrate and satisfy as many actors as possible, depoliticizing de itself in the process. Andras calls for a step up in the effort towards small politicization, which would uncover clear political lines and for the establishment of more responsive institutions based on the input legitimacy of the citizens. Franz Josef Almeyer, who is there, discusses on how we can use the new tools available to us in the current era of information and how we can implement them in, genu in genuine European uh, participatory democracy. The antidote to against the feeling of being left out, against being misrepresented. The advent of information revolution has become a driving force for a change in all sectors, yet governance remains a long overdue exception. And it's really the time to change that. Simona Broncute examines on what happened with the European Citizen Initiative that was meant as a tool of a direct democracy, democracy inside the European Union, but had been lacking in really engaging the citizens and really even getting into our heads. Did we even know that this kind of thing exists? For a very long time, I didn't really know a thing like European Citizen Initiative really exists, but it had already existed for a few years. All is not lost and there is something to learn from the first implementations to still make it work as a tool to really make us engage directly with policymaking. Aticha Yahik points out the need to do better work with our civic education. Where is Aticha? Yeah. 
uh, and that we really need to work with our civic education, which is the stepping stone for a successful particip participatory democracy. Citizens must not only be able to understand the functioning of the European political system, but also think critically about the issues of the EU's, EU's agenda and be aware of the channels they can use to influence it. For this, effective civic education programs are essential and, es es and it's super essential because as an old social sciences teacher, I think it's one of the most important classes in the school. Luis Placido Santos argues that through wider tackling of corruption, we can restore trust and increase wider participation in our political systems. He also points out the need for EU to take a more proactive role to create a directive that requires member states to achieve a symmetric result on whistleblower protection. Having the EU setting the agenda on fighting against corruption could give the much needed positive signal to EU citizens that the EU is doing something to protect their interests. And in this sense, demonstrate and increase the EU's legitimacy itself. So, we are at a crossroad. We either start acting now or the European project as we know it falls to an even deeper cataclysm of problems. The sense of urgency, which we post possessed very much in the discussions with fellow future labbers, uh, we feel it's not that seriously taken by policymakers. And today, we have the ability to speak directly with you of the decision makers who will most surely turn my remarks, hopefully stating that we are working on it to make Europe great again. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Ivo. So I think that you um, summarized the long-lasting debates that we had within uh, the group very, very well. So now I would like to uh, to turn to uh, to our speaker um, because we heard that the the challenges are uh, numerous. Um, that um, we heard also from Ivo that we are in front of. Uh, what you described as, uh, as uh, I wouldn't say an impossible task, but at least a very difficult uh, uh, challenge to bring back the citizens at the uh, heart of, the, of, the, um, of our political system um, and of the decision-making process. So, um, Mr. Silva Mendes, you have been um, involved in uh, many initiatives uh, to make the voice of citizens uh, heard and um, mostly of uh, young people. So could you um, please explain um, so what the European Commission is doing to address um, these uh, challenges and uh, to ensure that the voice of young people are heard? Okay. I talk here or there? Up to you. No problem. Okay. Here is much better. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. First of all, I would like to uh, thank you and uh, congratulate you for this initiative, uh, for the, the report and for the manifesto. Uh, I re yesterday, when I uh, was uh, uh, preparing myself for, for, for this, uh, for, for the talk, because I was, uh, well, first of all, I would like to, to apologize. Uh, um, uh, because uh, uh, Martin Heischartz, our director general, should be here, and she's sick, so she can't be. But uh, she asked me to, to, to present you. And it is really a great pleasure for me to, to, to be here and to discuss with you. Uh, as I said uh, yesterday, when I was looking at uh, uh, what you are doing and the, the report that you sent to me, uh, I have to say that I expected a little bit more. Apologize me, but I want to be uh, here a little bit also provocative. We are uh, confronted with a situation where we have problems. We have problems on inclusion. We have problems on participation. We have problems on employment. We have a lot of problems. We have a situation where uh, young people in Europe, we are, you are around 90, 90 million. Uh, we have, uh, as uh, uh, President Juncker said at a certain point, uh, uh, we are confronted with uh, 26 uh, or 29th member state, which is the more than 26 million uh, young people that are unemployed, uh, unfortunately. So we have a, a, a dramatic situation. So 
what we have to do is to do concrete things. Uh, we have been producing a lot of good papers, uh, excellent uh, uh, instruments. Uh, we have uh, the youth strategy that is there, the framework that we have put it in place uh, from 2011 to 2018, which is re basically the frame where we uh, introduce the structure dialogue and reinforce the structure dialogue with, with young people. We have, for example, last year, and now it's uh, finished and is published, the youth report. Uh, where we take stock of a, a number of, uh, of things, namely one of the, the, the main considerations is that uh, this young generation is the generation that has better qualifications, better degrees, has never. Nevertheless, we have strong divisions. There is a, a, a divided situation where young, some young people have strong opportunities, but others have even less opportunities. So how can we address this, uh, this, uh, the, this issue collectively? So we have to go a little bit more concrete. You in the, in the manifesto. I, yesterday I, I went uh, to that and then I have to tweet. Because one of the feelings that I have is that we, it's not only you, but we collectively, are always saying, you should do something. And we very rarely say, we have to do something. So what I strongly suggest to you is that you really involve yourselves more actively. In the, the, I have to say that I agree basically with most of your, of your diagnosis. Uh, the situation you, ha you, you say uh, that we are living in a complex policy situation, which is true. Uh, we lack re uh, some responses, which is true. Uh, we have uh, sometimes very, very, very often a, a, a more national approach to the, to the European uh, problems, which is true. I have also to say that we have a strong economic difficulty. The, city, the economic situation is, is difficult. We don't have enough jobs. We don't have enough enterprises. So this is also something that compli co complify, uh, complexifies the situation. We have in the education system some missings, some uh, some some uh, uh, some misdoings. So, but we have collectively to address the situation with concrete actions, with with concrete elements. For example, we I think you are here, uh, and those who are here are absolutely convinced that you have to participate. But is this the reality at European level, in the local, in the municipalities, even in Brussels, to not go too, too, too far away? Are this really the recognition? So how can we go further? How can we have these 28 million people embraced in this, in this movement? So in very concrete terms, what are we trying to do? Uh, is, uh, let's say, we have introduced and uh, collectively, we, I think we have, as I said, a very good uh, political instruments. We have recognized that uh, the values, the democratic values are introduced in, the, in our treaty, the social inclusion, the active participation. We have recognized that. My, my, my question is, how can we translate these values into concrete actions? I think we have to, to go further on increasing active participation at local level. How can we go at different municipalities, at different regions in Europe, at different member states, and try to have the young people participation? Because the, the, those that are here normally in these events are convinced. The question is, how can we go, go there? And then one of the, uh, the ideas is, for example, to use as much as possible the programs that we have. Erasmus Plus is there for providing some funds. Okay, not very much, but some funds that can, you, can be used for increased participation. And we, in the, in the, in the use uh, area, we will see in the next uh, uh, year and the years uh, following a very big increase in the, uh, in the budget that will be allocated to the youth component, to the youth area. So please, 
let's use this kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of instruments. Of course, we are also working collectively uh, with, with the other policies because if we want to address the, 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 the situation, we have to consider that the youth policy that we are and I'm promoting, uh, uh, it cannot be solved, can, 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 cannot solve the entire problem, problematic of the issues. We have to have a cross-sectoral approach. We have to have an integration between the different policies. The, use, the education, the sports, the employment, uh, the industry, uh, all different policies should go together in an interactive uh, manner. For example, how could we involve more and more uh, the municipalities? How can we, because normally at national level, who is addressing the problematic of the uh, uh, social inclusion is normally at local and regional level. How can we involve them on, on, on board? Uh, another instrument that we are trying to use, and this is uh, Commission of Navrasic's priority, is the, uh, how can we reach the young people? Because something is to pass the communication, but then is how can we have their, their involvement? So we, we, we are cooperating with the Youth Forum, we are cooperating with the National Council, Councils to have their opinion and to have their opinion on the traditional uh, policy elements. But one key issue now is how young people see Europe. What is Europe for, for you, for them? Uh, what can we bring to them? Because it's easy to say, okay, you have participate, but usually we can, we can say, but what is in it for me? So we have to demonstrate to them that this is something. And we can't do, we can do what we can do at European level, uh, at the Commission level, at European Parliament level, but we have to count on you. The, the ONGs that are working with young people, that are working with and for young people. So this is really what uh, I would like to, 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 mm, to say today. So basically, uh, use as much as possible the f program that we have uh, on uh, 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 Erasmus Plus because there we can have uh, strong instruments that can support through uh, direct work or through uh, <coughs> the volunteering service. We can support volunteers. We can support uh, mm, this instrument which can help people to go abroad and to work with, for example, the refugees, because this is one of the, the, the situations we have. We can have, we, as you know, we have uh, this approach of the European Voluntary Service, which is something that can be very instrumental for, for this purpose. So I think that the challenge we are facing requests concrete actions, request certainly to have the strategy, and I, 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 I totally agree with uh, your diagnosis, uh, but I would suggest that we need to go further. We need to really present concrete instruments that can allow, motivate the young people outside of the normal suspects, outside of the normal uh, young people that we, we are addressing. So these are some ideas, but uh, uh, I'm, I will be very happy to continue to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Silva Mendes. So, Antonio. <laughs> so, I'm uh, now turning to our uh, s uh, second uh, speaker, so Sven Gigor, who has been uh, an MEP since um, 2009. Um, so, as I said, who has been uh, involved in many uh, grassroots movements. Um, so we see that um, citizens are largely uh, disengaged from politics and in particular from politics at the, at the European um, level. So for instance, uh, if we look at the evolution of um, the level of participation, so we see that the uh, turnout rates um, in uh, European elections are, are um, in decline and that there is this growing disconnect uh, between uh, citizens and then their representatives. So uh, my question um, is, um, let's say, twofold and very much in line with also the summary uh, that Ivo provided of, of our publication. 
So uh, first, um, so I, I wonder how the EU institutions and in particular the European Parliament can uh, re-establish trust and can also provide solutions uh, to um, the well denounced uh, democratic uh, deficit that we have at the European level. And the, the second question is uh, more uh, general on the, the state of democracy in Europe. Um, so, and how you think that the EU could promote a new form of, uh, of democracy? Well, uh, mm. Of course, uh, the answer to such questions can only be 42. Uh, how many understand uh, this joke? Ah, only a few. So, uh, yes, so there's a great book uh, which is, uh, which called Where a Machine is Asked to Answer All Questions of the World, and it calculates with the superpower of a modern technology and comes then finally up with the answer of 42. So, uh, of course, the question to be answered and how to invent a new form of democracy is impossible uh, on such a panel. But I would really like to take seriously, rather than giving you now my view of what things have to be done, but taking seriously what you wrote and answer as a policymaker to what you answer. Sorry to allow me, and we can then uh, elaborate. But I would like to say that... Um, I w just to, to make clear what I have been doing, so I was since my time at school active in civil society and was then asked six years ago by the Greens to, uh, to run for the European Parliament and have then in my area of expertise, which is very much financial markets and the control of tax havens, which is also one of the issues in the report, uh, that um, I have then been active in helping to reform the financial system here in Europe after the crisis. And during that time, I made a lot of experience because, in, in effect, lots of the demands which we had in civil society could be seriously debated in the European Parliament. So I would say my, myself, I've made a rather positive experience with European democracy. And quite a lot of the things we were demanding in the streets are now in the law. Not everything, but there was real change. So it is possible through the European institutions uh, in a moment of crisis, like the financial crisis of 2009, to have tougher controls on the banks, to have tougher controls on European financial markets and hold um, financial players accountable to democracy. Uh, but at the same time, I also learned that there was very f quickly the, the limits of what could be done were reached. And, uh, and this uh, led me to, in the new mandate, to concentrate much more on issues of democracy. I'm now um, the, um, the rapporteur for an initiative report in the Constitutional Committee, which is my second committee, which is called um, Transparency, Integrity and Accountability of the European Institutions. And this is exactly uh, the issue of your report. So what is the functioning uh, of democracy in Europe? Why are we in, in trouble? And, uh, and what can be done about it? Uh, and this was my interest in that subject was shaped because while I was a policymaker on financial markets, uh, I, I learned uh, that we have here in Brussels 1,700 stakeholder representatives, many often called lobbyists, uh, paid by the financial industry, while there are only 40 who are paid by consumers, trade unions or the like who work in the same area but are not paid by the financial industry themselves. So you can see a huge imbalance of influence on the European democracy by the ones who are mo have most money to pay for it while the ordinary citizen is, of course, represented, hopefully, through their government, through members of parliament, through the European Commission and the like. So the institutions which should act in the common interest, but very often, of course, are under pressure by powerful vested interests, which then lead to policy results which don't serve all. And now I would like to come back to what I see the main subject of your report. So why are large parts of society uh, lost their love with the European project and have lost trust uh, with the European project and what can be done about it. And I think, of course, what is key 
in order to trust democracy is that people have two feelings. First, the democracy serves their interest, and second, they can have a say. So, and, and the distrust in democratic institutions is not only specific for, Europe, for the European Union, but it is equally the case for the member states, and it's even the case equally in Japan and in the United States. So well, if we take a bit wider view on these subjects, it is a crisis of Western democracy. And interestingly, the crisis is not with you. Therefore, I will totally abstain from any calls on you as young people to engage more and those are, you are already engaged. I don't have to Europeanize you because you are already European, probably much more than I am. Your English might be more elaborate, uh, you have been in love with more other Europeans than I was, and so on. So, uh, so you are already the European generation. But the trouble is when you come to your home member state, the people who vote for the anti-Europeans, you feel much further away from them than from this group here. And that is the trouble. And the same you have in the United States. The young who applaud Bernie Sanders, they feel so far away from these crazy supporters of Donald Trump. And, uh, and that is the real issue. So the speed of modernization, the speed of integration of the global market has produced winners and losers. And our society is more and more split. And the ones who are well educated, who wear already a tie when they are 20, and the ones who, have, uh, who are scared, that uh, their parents will lose their job or have already lost it, and they feel themselves they don't bring the cultural and education capital with them in order to profit from that huge speed of development of humanity, which globalization is. I think it is a huge opportunity, but it leaves many people back, backwards. The ones who have now to compete with the wage rates of the poorest in the world because they have not more cultural and education capital, they, uh, they are low, their wages were lowered or have not developed, while the richer were profiting. And with richness, I don't mean only money, I also mean cultural capital. Those have profited and they feel further and further away from each other. And the trouble is democracy can only function on a certain level of social equality. And with social equality, I don't mean mainly money. I mean a feeling of togetherness, of being in a similar situation, very much Scandinavian uh, values, yeah, to put it like that. And even in Sweden, which wa I was always a German who loved Sweden, the, the, the Swedish Democrats, this horrible Nazi party, they are now uh, very much uh, uh, on the top of the polls, so very close at least to it. So we have the same de development. And therefore, I think, if we want to tackle this question of trust, we must tackle the division of society. That is the core question. So what can Europe do so that the people who feel under pressure, that they feel Europe for them is not a threat, but it is also creating opportunities for them. I would like to make a number of suggestions. So um, I think first, um, of we should have something like Erasmus for all, not only plus, but for all. The vision should be for all. Everyone who has been to another country, fell in love with a citizen of another country, will have much more difficulty to believe that the nation state and the, and the going backwards to a community of equal members of one nation can be the solution for the future. So I think all young people, regardless whether they are students or not, also if they don't go to university, they go, should get the offer financed uh, on the basis of the European budget to go for one year in another European country. This would be not only one million Erasmus babies, which we have now, but it would be a proliferation of Erasmus babies. And I think that could be a fabric uh, at which could also reach uh, weaker parts of, uh, of uh, population. Today, of course, 
often Erasmus can only be afforded by the parents which can subsidize it uh, to a certain level and therefore many of the weaker parts of, young pe uh, of society, their kids don't go to Erasmus and that must end. Second, I think we need a strong investment effort on the European level. What I mean with this is we have tried to curtail some misdoings in some member states by European laws with limited success, with some success, but limited success. You were speaking about corruption in your report, but, uh, and we tried to uh, end certain endless indebtedness of some countries with limited success, as yesterday's figures have shown. But I think what we haven't done is we haven't done real future investment on the European level. And we have the opportunity uh, to uh, create uh, a real investment program which should be geared towards uh, the future sectors. So what I mean with this is education, uh, health, uh, but also, of course, green technologies which reconcile welfare with uh, the sustainability of the planet. You can hear I'm a green. Yeah? But I, it's, uh, I believe we have to invest in these future technologies so that not in the end uh, we will be, uh, uh, I put it uh, to the extreme, losing our competitiveness edge uh, in comparison to other regions in the world, in particular Asia, which develops uh, uh, with a, a staggering speed, in particular in future technologies. And, uh, and these sort of investment efforts, which would create jobs, could show that Europe does something also for the ones who are at the moment, as you uh, were also pointing out, these 28 million who feel what has Europe really done. They have done a Europe uh, a youth future program, and, uh, and, uh, but it was not financed, and therefore many member states haven't implemented it, and therefore in the end there was a great youth blah blah, but the 28 million have the imp uh, impression Europe has talked about them, but hasn't really acted. You will, can now list your concrete measures, but that is the feeling. So, that, so therefore, to put it short, I think we have output problems of the European <coughs> uh, project. We do not solve enough these real questions of society and, and Europe doesn't uh, visibly uh, act in enough in order to come out of that mess. And why is that the case? I believe the key thing, and there I agree with the report, is that our institutions are based still on, on the lowest denominator of the member states. So very often it is not the European general interest prevailing as an outcome of our decision making in Europe, but it is, uh, it is that uh, the member states uh, all uh, have to decide together in the council behind closed doors and uh, very often very far away from what, uh, what is discussed on the European level and even less uh, what they, uh, they have truly discussed in their member states. So our decision-making system is still is not fit for a time of strong European integration. It is still basically, to a large extent, a collection of member states, and the member states block each other uh, to solve the crisis. And therefore, the crises are piling up. So the social crisis, the Eurozone problems, our lack of effective foreign policy, which was um, named where Europe is weak because we have 28 foreign policies in many areas on, of the world and not one. And uh, the same uh, holds, of course, true uh, for problems of human rights and democracy in some of the member states, where basically Europe uh, is not able uh, to really act if certain principles uh, of uh, parliamentary democracy and fundamental rights are violated in a part of our own countries. And uh, the same holds true with the common migration policy and the many deaths in the Mediterranean where visibly Europe is not able to find a proper solution uh, so that uh, this is uh, ended. So uh, uh, I would say the, the, common, the common policy outcomes are not there because we still depend on behind closed doors smallest common denominator and uh, in the council of member states and not by a true politicization as it was uh, discussed in the report on the european <coughs> level what is the european common good and then take a decision 
uh, in the collective interest. And this is now a long history of uh, many member states as well, because uh, many of our member states, uh, Germany in particular, but also in Italy and France and so on, it was a struggle between center and the regions. And now we have in Europe a struggle between uh, the common interest and the member states in many areas. So we are in the disease of federalism, to put it like that. And, uh, and this can only be overcome in moments of crisis. And my hope is now, and there I think it would be important that many raise their voice, is that in particular the vote on Brexit uh, forces many member states to rethink whether they now want to let Europe move into not a great again, but a, a collective weakening, uh, or whether after that Brexit vote, until then nothing serious will happen in any policy field. But after this vote, will there be from France, Italy, Germany, Poland, many others, a rethinking whether they really want this weakening of the continent or whether they are ready to share more sovereignty in a democratic uh, way. And, uh, and that is, uh, of course, can only be done uh, with changes in the treaties. So without some changes in the treaties, it is impossible to come to that politicization. Because at the moment, regardless with, with which program you run, you cannot realize it. Because if you vote for Juncker rather than for Schulz or for a Green Commission president, as you are suggesting, once the guy is <coughs> at the Commission uh, uh, top, he still depends on the member states and cannot act. So Juncker promised lots of things, many of them he will never realize because he, he ha it is not a true government in the sense it has a parliamentary majority, a government, and then they take decisions, but you always depend uh, on, the vo uh, on the willingness of the member states. So if we want a stronger democracy in Europe with more input, we must dare true European decision making. So with publicity of the decisions, with, um, and then also a, a, a governmental level which uh, is truly able to deliver uh, what it has promised after, of course, verification in a parliament. So I think the, the big issue is if you want to have more influence and more politicization of the European level, you need uh, to define clearly what is common European policy, and that should truly be decided on the European level, and what is left to the member states, and that should be on the level of the member state. But the mixture of the two ends up in a piling up of not uh, um, convincingly resolved crises. And lastly, in comparison to this challenge, all the nitty-gritty details about some more education, how Europe works, some more European citizens' initiative and so on, this seems to me all very small uh, in comparison. So these parts of the report, all the suggestions I, 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 I support, but I think I mi they miss a bit the point why people don't join these initiatives. And they don't join them because they have the feeling if they join a citizen's initiative or if they send messages to politicians, it has not the true effect. And people participate if they feel that their participation changes something. And they change, uh, you can see there I'm an economist by training. So, uh, it's a, so and they change things if, if institutions can truly take decisions. And our problem today is that the institutions of Europe uh, are, have difficulties in the key questions that matter to take decisions in the collective interest. So therefore, I would call on the Future Lab to think more uh, with their demands on this social gap and second, uh, on the ability of institutions to truly, truly take decisions in the collective interest because only if we have tre real decision-making capacity on the European level, people will feel it's valuable to call on these institutions and to trust them. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, it is a bit participation into a policy space which has huge difficulties 
to agree on anything meaningful. And I think it's exactly this feeling why people lost uh, so much hope in the European project. So these would be a few reflections on your report, and I'm very curious what you are going to say on that. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Sven, so for your uh, reaction to the report and also for the very insightful um, uh, comments and also for sharing the, the your personal diagnosis of um, democracy in Europe. So um, there will be um, some time uh, for uh, questions. And here, so I would like also to mention that um, so the event is, is uh, live stream, so uh, for people sitting outside this room, it's also possible to um, to, to join the debate uh, with the hashtag so I participate and to raise uh, your, your questions. But before doing that and before opening up the, the floor, so I also want to um, introduce so Simona Ponscote, who is also representative of, uh, of uh, the Future Lab uh, program, who also contributed to our uh, publication. Um, and maybe making the link also with uh, what uh, Sven was um, was uh, saying, because you very much um, at the beginning of your of your talk emphasized on the um, the output uh, problems that we have at um, at the EU level, and that these output uh, issues, are, I would say, or just to 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 sum up your your, your talk. Um, a direct cause also of the uh, lack of participation and of the input also issue that we have uh, at the European uh, level. So Simona, you have been uh, working a lot on the European uh, Citizens Initiative. So uh, do you share the view of, um, of Sven? And what do you have to say particularly on the misfunctioning of this uh, initiative? Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today with you and to share um, my experience with civil society in Europe and citizens' initiatives. To make it more interactive, I would like to ask you, have you, have you ever signed a citizens' initiative? Raise your hands up. Oh, very few. <laughs> have you ever volunteered for any organization or initiative? Oh, this looks more optimistic. <laughs> uh, so to begin with, with European citizens' initiatives. It has been four years when the uh, European Citizens' Initiatives enter uh, into the force. And as we can see, uh, over these four years, there were some uh, further development and also still many obstacles. First of all, uh, only three out of 56 European Citizens' Initiatives managed to collect over one million signatures across Europe. So it shows that it's really very difficult to mob mobilize European citizens to sign this initiative because many of them, as Sven and also Antonio mentioned, lack of this knowledge of the European Union. Also many people are disengaged and really don't understand uh, how does it work with the EU institutions. Many people don't understand how works regional authorities, local authorities, national authorities. We, we don't talk about EU because it sounds too complex. So what I experienced over this uh, last four years is that uh, um, th the biggest challenge is how to involve disadvantaged people, how to raise awareness of citizens' initiatives in general, and also even on the petitions, or on any kind of these activities. It's very difficult to empower these people and to explain that, that they can be uh, change make makers. As somebody also mentioned that if you go to events, even events about European Citizens Initiative, you would meet almost always the same people. Also over these four years, very few new people join uh, the coalition or advocacy campaigning for European Citizens Initiative. So it shows that yes, European Parliament, particularly Greens and some other MEPs, they, they strongly advocated for more citizens friendly European Citizens Initiative. European Parliament passed a resolution that the uh, Commission should collaborate closely, uh, not only with European Parliament, but also to involve, for example, Ombudsman, European Economic Social Committee, Committee of the Regions, 
but also that civil society should be more in involved uh, in this uh, process uh, regarding the further development of European citizens' initiative. So if we uh, look at, at this side, we can see that Yes, there is some development, but we have a decreasing number of European citizens' initiatives. And why it's happening? It's happening because uh, many of uh, initiative teachers are volunteers. And it's very difficult, you can tr trust me, to commit two years of your life to work on voluntary basis and to strongly believe it. It's very difficult to convince your peer fellows to believe in the same thing for two or three years. You can be very enthusiastic in the beginning, but what happens next is that uh, many of these people, they are not professional campaigners. Many of them, they don't have a huge networks to international organizations, to European organizations. So also it's uh, more difficult to make an impact. I can give you a very good example. A European Commission rejected citizens initiative stop TTIP because it was out of the um, EU competences. Nevertheless, uh, organizers, they strongly believe in this issue, so they launch a citizens organized uh, initiative. Uh, it's collected over three million signatures within one year. It's a record. It has never happened with an official European citizens initiative. It got strong, strong support from certain politicians, MEPs, civil society, particularly in Germany. People went to the streets. They organized demonstrations. But what happened that um, certain responsible uh, European institutions didn't react to citizens' concerns. And you can imagine how many efforts and time organizers dedicated to happen to this initiative. And in the end, uh, nothing happened. There are no changes. And um, certain institutions and politicians or commissioners, they didn't take into account uh, citizens' concerns. And I think that it also shows the lack of recognition of this kind of the activities at a regional, local, national, or even European level. If you would tell to people that you volunteer for animal shelters, uh, for children, for any kind of small organizations, usually you lack of this uh, recognition. And also many local politici politicians, MEPs, they also don't recognize these uh, activities as a part of participatory democracy. And also, uh, many European citizens' initiatives showed because the, the topics were very, uh, they were topics about um, testing animals in the science, uh, human embryos, um, about education, uh, about water. So it shows also that uh, people have very um, diverse range of interest. But the problem is that it's really very difficult for, for, for a random citizen to make this change at the, at the EU level. At, at what showed this recent example of stop TTIP, that yes, we mobilized over three million citizens, but nothing has happened. So my concerns and questions would be how to upscale these tools to make it more efficient and how to bring European citizens closer to the European Union, how to make citizens again to believe in these tools of participatory and direct democracy, and how particularly to involve people from disconnect, uh, disconnected people, disadvantaged people, because many of these people who are in involved, they are somehow privileged, so they have a certain no knowledge about these tools and understanding, even if you look at Erasmus Plus programs, Many organizations, they participate every year. They submit projects. So for newcomers, it's also very difficult. So the problem is also that it's very difficult for new activists to, to enter this ground and to make an impact. So this would be my short intervention. Thank you very much, Simona. So, uh, as I said, so there will be some time for uh, opening up the floor and also for involving you in the, in the discussion. But before doing that, I would like also to give the chance to Ivo, maybe to, um, to react to the speaker's intervention. Yeah. <coughs> so, um, of course, I completely agree with everything on the questions raised by Simona on how, to, how, to, how, how can we make sort of the citizens' initiative more visible. Because... Uh, one of the things that uh, I felt even when I, I've been like talking around schools in Estonia, for example, is that we're often, you have this question of 
do even young people consider themselves sort of part of the European community? They consider themselves being European, but do, them, do themselves consider themselves part of the community? And on what, how, what can we do on sort of on that field? And very often we talk about social sciences, <coughs> but I think the subject itself should should change into so, uh, social participation classes or whatever else. Because uh, I think the participation level is much, even often, much more important. The knowledge comes very often th from the practical sides, and uh, the practicalities often lead us to the other developments. So, wh what I see and uh, where I also s uh, agree a lot with Antonio is the part that these uh, programs, like uh, structured dialogue, they're very useful but still uh, they very often sort of lack the necessity to really uh, gather everybody into this uh, into this movement so so if we, if we young work with young people we really really have to push that the, the same idea that sort of the feeling of being part of the being the european people has to be very much implemented also into these programs yep. yeah. thank you antonio you want to i see you yeah. want to react yes uh, two things uh, on the Erasmus, on the Erasmus Plus uh, program itself, I believe the way the Erasmus Plus have been implemented, it means even if it is called Erasmus Plus, e the intention is Erasmus for all, because the, the initial idea and the initial proposal, even uh, from the Commission, was Erasmus for all. But uh, we get this kind of consensus. Nevertheless, the content in, its, uh, in itself is trying to combine uh, the excellence from one side, but also the equity and the inclusion from the other side. We have in the, in the Erasmus Plus component for use a more inclusive, a very inclusive approach, where we have, for example, the, on the uh, 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 European Voluntary Service, where we now are celebrated the 20th anniversary. Uh, we have already uh, promoted the, 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 the exchange of more than 100,000. Uh, uh, okay, it's not enough. It's, it's there. And this, this, this is the reason why I'm saying we have to promote. We have to, because the Commission can't do the project in itself. It's the uh, beneficiaries, the ONGs that have to use it. And we have there, and we have the cooperation with, uh, with uh, uh, um, the member states, because the Erasmus Plus component of use is essentially run at national level by the national agencies. So there, they are doing a lot, uh, a, a lot of work. But I totally agree uh, with, uh, with Ivo. We have to make a more cross-sectoral approach. In what extent use can go to the schools? How can we have this kind of interaction? I think there is really uh, 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 one of uh, one of the solutions that we could uh, um, we, we we could do. So, if we succeed to motivate the outsiders, because here you are motivated, this uh, this is no question, and the, the the fact that you are here, you are participating, you are. But the question is, how can we? approach the others, the others 28 or 26 million young people that are outside, that and very, very often they are in the need of uh, uh, being involved. I'm sure that if we are s sufficiently clever, we can have them on board. But this is from, uh, uh, from our side. We have the obligation to, to demonstrate that we can do when what we are trying to do is something very useful. Uh, very often, I'm well. I'm engineer by training, uh, even if I have not mm, worked in the, in 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 in, a, in an industry. But uh, this leads to me to be relatively pragmatic. There are things that we can't do, and very often, if we can't do, uh, let's try to do what we can do. In what extent we can influence in our march of maneuver. If we put our effort in this in this area, we certainly can be a very, very, very much more much more efficient. Thank you. So I see some um, questions already. So I will um, take a first round of uh, of questions. So please, many, yeah. So a first one here. And if you could please introduce yourself. 
Yes, hello. My name is uh, Masi from Audio App. It's also on my shirt. Um, to, I really like the idea of participating, and I think uh, we should uh, have more participation and action and pra practical action. And um, for youth, uh, I have a question actually for everybody. Um, is it an idea that we create some kind of platform, uh, or use digitalization for uh, participation, and then make it fun also? Because if you want to um, involve a lot of young people, make a fun platform where you can vote, where you can see new uh, news coming, where you can understand uh, what's happening, and participate with each other on that level. I'm wondering what, what you guys think and what the crowd thinks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So I will uh, take some more questions. Okay. <coughs> uh, Thank you. Uh, Professor Linson from the MNRC New Poll Network. Um, I trained as a physician and specialized in neurosciences, but I also play the piano and violin. Uh, yes, um, I have a few um, comments to make. I make them short. Um, uh, Sven, you're my first victim. Um, yes, uh, lobbies. Uh, one powerful lobby that is uh, largely underestimated is education has devastating effect. There is a need for a fundamental education revolution, and uh, traditional uh, education is pulling everything back. Uh, youth, um, I mean, it's just like the elderly. I mean, the youth and the elderly, I mean, they are, they are not special species. They all form part of society. So, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, finally, Antonio. Um, I hope you won't shoot me at the end of uh, my... Um, so it's not no. nothing personal. I, I, I don't know you, so it's... Uh, okay. Um, you say you, we need your participation. I mean, you. Uh, okay. Um, I attended a debate on Imagine Europe at the beaux a debate between commas. And uh, there was a representative from the European Commission who said exactly that. He made a speech, and he uh, finished his speech by asking the audience to participate. The audience was not invited to take part in the debate. In complete contradiction with uh, the um, European Commission representative. So, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, finally, yeah, trust. This is so important. However, I, uh, I was on the European Parliament premises yesterday, and I noted that there was, in fact, a selective uh, expression of interest allowed, because there were some people who wanted to demonstrate against the, the, the visits of an Indonesian state of, uh, member of state. They were not allowed to demonstrate. They were not allowed to present their flag. They were just, no, not allowed. The second thing is that, well, uh, Eurosciences, or Euroscience, Foresight, and the EIT are so-called European institution initiatives that have been directly inspired from my work without the slightest economic recognition, a complete violation of intellectual property rights. And uh, there is, uh, for the moment, um, legal action that is being uh, considered against DG, Education and Culture, and the EIT for plagiarism. So I recently wrote an article entitled uh, European Institutions, You Are Exasperating. And to my mind, the European institutions should stop messing around, creating projects after projects that have little or no sustainable impact on the citizens' well-being quality of life, and instead, first, concentrate on three points. One, settling its own chronic internal dysfunctions before allowing itself to give advice to others or set an example to others. Uh, recovering the citizen's trust and credibility. And finally, to also perhaps uh, concentrating on trying to integrate the already existing projects and past projects together for maximum added value, this would lead to innovative solutions that have yet to be found to achieve and sustain the citizens' well-being quality of life. The European institutions are unable to do either. 
Thank you. Thank you. And I take a third question, so the gentleman. So there will be other rounds of questions, so don't. Yeah, my name is Tony Venables, and I just finished a book on these issues, so I'm very interested in the debate. I think Erasmus reaches about 4 million people, and uh, I had to do some calculations to take up uh, Sven's proposal of an Erasmus for all, and it's about half the current budget, so there's a big leap. If you really wanted Erasmus for all, it would cost something in the region of 70 billion. And it's important because unless a more critical mass of people are educated and informed, any reforms by the EU will not work. They, they don't register with enough uh, uh, people. I'd like to suggest something for Future Lab, which I promise you is not in my book, going beyond it. I think it would be worth nevertheless working on some small steps. Um, and to think about uh, what a European public sphere actually means. I mean, it's, it's sort of touched on by a lot of people, and I think it can be brought down to a more practical level. I think there's three things. I think the first is that a lot of it does exist, and the, the Commission has public spaces in all the member states, practically, but they, they need strengthening. They should be real participation spaces run in conjunction with civil society because the Commission's costs are far too high to do this properly. They need alliances. And that would be physical spaces linked to a, a digital approach as well, of course, in, but in every member states. Often the reforms just don't go far enough everywhere. We can see it in Berlin or in Paris, but maybe not in Estonia, certainly not in my own country. The, sec the second thing I would recommend is, is one word mentioned by the Commission of synergy. I think there's a, always a tendency with the EU to seize on the latest reform, uh, like Citizens' Initiative, as this is, is the gadget which is going to solve the the problems. And I think one could look across the board at complaints, access to documents, mm -hmm. petitions, the role of the ombudsman, citizens' initiatives. They're all means to the same end. And, and work on them, develop them, get them better known. And the third thing is, I think this is more, perhaps more radical, I would radically change the funding situation, I would fund the European public sphere, so the translation costs, some of the travel costs, communication costs, and stop grants to individual organizations which come up with short-lived projects which don't link up with other projects, um, so that you would be enabling citizens to do things, not <coughs> telling them to do things through a sum of money and allowing them to plug into Europe if, if they, they want to. But thank you for a very interesting thank you. debate. Thank you. So we now go back to um, the panelists, but also I would like to encourage um, so the authors of uh, the publication to maybe take the floor and to uh, complement also the, the, the answers. So I'm looking at, um, so starting with the first uh, question on um, about um, creating this um, kind of platform through uh, technologies, etc. So wh who would like to... Um, I to can. pick up on that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Antonio. Uh, on this specific issue, on the specific issue of the digital thing, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, approach. Uh, as you know, we, we have uh, uh, now trying to uh, reformulate what we call the European Youth Portal in order to become more interactive. Of course, we are still in a web traditional uh, approach, even if we are talking about a portal, it's already, it can create a sort of a more interactive, but it's still something that uh, it's not yet completely integrated in the new, in the new uh, social media area. We have to, to have something that integrates all the different elements. And at, 
European level, at, at institutional level, we, can, we have to be uh, honest with ourselves. We have not some flexibility, the flexibility that we can have. But this kind of initiatives can be also supported under Erasmus+. Plus. So the kind of initiative that can, well, if you propose something that integrates uh, young people in different ways using new technologies, these are subject to eventual some, some kind of funding. So I encourage you to, 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 to propose and to suggest this kind of initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Sven? If I may. Um, comment and try also to, to stay a bit provocative. I think there's one tension in the report and which reflects also well the debate here. On the one hand, the report calls for more politicization. Politicization means that there are different positions struggling with each other. Yeah? On the other hand, there's all the time talk on public's European sphere uh, and, uh, and European space and so on. I think in order to revive participation in the pro European project, one has to take positions and fight. So that is the key uh, idea of politization. So you have to have different views and then you struggle with each other and try to win. That is what happens on the national level all the time. So NGOs, employers, trade unions, churches, all sorts of people, young people, they struggle for resources, for better laws, for more power. And this, this struggle is not organized on a European level. Mm -hmm. And what you were quoting are examples of trying to organize struggle. Of course, it's part of this not to complain uh, that if you have one million signatures to end abortion, that you can then complain to the Commission, or oh, there were one million or five hundred signing, we should end abortion, and these bastards uh, of adversaries of democracy didn't follow the one million. Yeah? That is not a legitimation by itself. So the European Citizens Initiative is a tool in that struggle. And it should be enforced because it's good if more people participate to the European project for their interests. It, has, it revives European democracy. But it doesn't, replace, it doesn't replace the existence of different positions and the need to, to struggle for your, for your ideas. So therefore, there's a tension between European platforms for all and so on, and the need to take positions across countries and fight for these ideas. Yeah, you cannot have, uh, you, you basically need, but you, you need in a certain way the European space as a space where where people take positions and fight across, across countries for their interests and ideas. And, uh, in the, and there, the European Citizens Initiative uh, was one method, and I agree fully what you were saying. There are lots of other elements in European policy making which contribute to that and can be improved. You were naming the ombudsman, petitions, and so on. But of course, most important uh, uh, method in a democracy for that struggle I are elections. And uh, I agree fully with the report that the electoral law we have at the moment doesn't allow for European struggles of different visions, mm. what to happen on the European level, because the political parties which form then the European Parliament, uh, the different member parties took totally opposite positions during the elections. So if you take, uh, and that of course, uh, as there are no true European political parties and no true European political programs, uh, this is uh, possible uh, because nobody notices that uh, the conservatives in, say, in Poland take a totally different view on many important issues than the conservatives in, in France, and they are now afterwards in one political group. And that is... Uh, uh, and nobody noticed, and therefore the, the elections are not true moments of European representation. That needs European lists, as you were saying, European political programs. And for this, uh, one, one needs uh, a true engagement of those who want Europe, because otherwise we don't get there. So uh, it's therefore, and there I would like to ask the authors of the report and those who contributed to it here, 
do you agree with my basic, I would say, criticism to your report, that it is in a certain way not speaking enough of the social divisions, but speaking uh, as if there is a collective European uh, public sphere, which we need to tweak and enable with a uh, fancy platform, <coughs> citizens' initiatives, and rather stops to, to talk about the issue, how to, um, to empower those who, are, who feel disenfranchised from the, from the current development of economy and society, and then vote uh, for uh, their vision. And the vision is rather c closing the borders, uh, moving against others like migrants, uh, and uh, believe in the nation state. So I, I think that this is basically, in this respect, I feel your report is not political enough, not taking a, 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 a position in that area, and, uh, and therefore uh, missing a bit the point of this underlying social division, which is also um, uh, at the heart of this loss of belief in in uh, the democratic project. I would like to make, uh, say, one example which I find really inspiring. Uh, on the European level, some people from different countries have set up We Move EU. Who has seen that platform? We Move.eu. Yeah. So very few yet, but still 280,000 people have signed petitions on this European platform, which allows to address European policymakers across borders. And this WeMove.eu is trying to use the internet not in order to be a debating platform only, but mainly to pressure the European policymakers to take certain positions. It doesn't mean the European movement. Well, uh, it is uh, not. It, it is not a European movement. It is. It is. We, it was a group of citizens from different countries who have set it up, and now they have people can sign petitions to the European institutions and they will also call for protests and so on so it is uh, they also have an initiative to strengthen the European citizens initiative and uh, they try to organize power of citizens on the European level across borders and I think more areas of civil society just should just do that organize across borders but not being happy with uh, signing petitions alone but try to to, uh, to organize campaigns for, for their visions and ideas. And that is the basis of a European civil society, which has to, a truly European civil society, which is lacking so far. It is more limited to, as you were saying, some organizations which are co-funded with European money. Yeah. Uh, so that is what, uh, what I find, uh, would find truly inspiring when people get across, together across borders to fight for their ideas in contradiction with others. And then we have living European democracy. Mm. Thank you very much, Sven. I see that there will be some uh, reaction from the authors <coughs> so on, on, your, on your point, um, because so there was a clear chapter on, on that, so on the need to create a truly European political culture with... Uh, with clear political lines and um, also clashes between yeah, uh, yeah, bet yeah. between parties, but before giving them the, the the floor, so I just would like both of you, Antonio and and Sven, also to address the question on the need to reform education. Okay, uh, I think one one of the issues we are we are still living is that uh, we have very many individual initiatives and very little synergies amongst them in the different areas. We are addressing the, the problems uh, by doing uh, individual policies, individual initiatives. But when we do this initiative, we are not looking outside the, outside the box. We are not looking what the others have done and how can we build on the acquis that they exist. Uh, we launched uh, last year a database that can be uh, consulted by everybody on the different projects that have been financed through Erasmus+. Uh, if you are there, and I just look at it, on the youth component, we have financed at national, at European level, 14,000 projects covering the word youth. 
So you can go there and to see what exists, who, what is financed under the project, who is participating, who are the different partners. So this is an extremely useful database that can allow everybody to understand where are we and can build on that. So I think one of, uh, uh, one of the areas we have to address is this, how do we build on the, on the, on the, others, on the other experience? The other aspect is uh, the education area have to address the situation of the moment. How can we open the, s the schools, for example, to the outside world? So this is one, one extra element that we have also to, to address. How can we connect the use NGOs with the schools? So this is, these are areas where we, 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 we are focusing now. And at the end, how can we uh, be sure that the education is answering the needs of the society? Uh, sometimes, uh, well, the, my previous responsibility on vocational training, one of the main uh, uh, questions we were getting is that uh, there is some misunderstandings in the perceptions. Uh, if you ask uh, um, CEOs of enterprises uh, what they are, if the education school uh, the education system is addressing the necessary uh, questions of, uh, uh, in terms of skills for the market. Uh, enterprises were saying 70% no. If you ask the same question to the educators, uh, they will say 70% yes. So there is ca this kind of misperception that we are lacking uh, 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 a common understanding. So one of the, 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 the issues here is putting together, again, the different stakeholders to address the common issues. I think this, for me, one of the, uh, is one of the challenges we have to face is how can we collectively have the same approach and how can we integrate the different areas in a more common uh, political uh, umbrella. The synergies between the different sectors is one of the most important areas that we have to address. Okay. On the education? Well, on the education, um, I think uh, it is true that uh, European institutions and how you can engage on that level, of course, should be in the curricula. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I have noticed over the last, last 20 years one pattern. Always, if you have difficulties with a problem, you call on two things. First, on young people to solve the problem, and second, on education. Uh, that is very cheap way of for politics to getting out uh, of a problem because you shift uh, uh, the solution of a problem uh, first to young people and second to it's something uh, about ideas. I, I don't say it is unimportant that you get education, but if the if we see the European democracy pro uh, at stake, uh, then to call on education while uh, the adversaries of European democracy are gaining in the polls, that seems obviously not an adequate uh, reaction. So therefore, I agree that should be on the curricula. You don't learn enough about Europe. It's true, people move too little uh, to the European institutions uh, so that they can learn about it. It's also true there are lots of initiatives already financed by the Commission but also by others to, to help uh, young people and others to uh, understand European democracy. On the other hand, uh, we, there are reasons why in more and more countries, many of, in particular, young people vote for the extreme right. Mm. Uh, and therefore, the, we have, and that is basically my point I addressed also to the authors. Uh, I, I don't say you missed the point about the lack of controversy. Uh, that is true, you addressed it in your report. What I think you, you didn't address is that the, there are social and economic reasons uh, for um, a growing part of young people to lose hope with the way how our society and Europe is run. And that has to be tackled and it should be at the heart of our uh, political commitments <coughs> because only if they see hope in their future they will start to use what they learn at school about European uh, democracy and participation. 
uh, and this point I think is, is, is absolutely critical so that I would say the ones who have been on the better side of life uh, that they start struggling also for those uh, who have so far been left behind and if we continue to leave them behind they will start uh, destroy, uh, continuing or continue to destroy our European future and that we shouldn't let allow. That is my basic criticism and, uh, and the point I think which I lacked a bit in the report. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I see some reactions from the, from the future labels. So Pe, so who also contributed to uh, write the, the introduction of the publication. Hi, my name is Per, and uh, I also contributed to the uh, report. Um, I would like to challenge uh, Sven and ask uh, some questions because what you're saying uh, reminds me very much of one of my favorite uh, books, uh, which is uh, The Coming Anarchy, which was an <laughs> article. No, listen, it's, a, it's an article <laughs> and later a book from the early 90s where uh, Robert Kaplan envisions uh, international sphere where conflicts primarily are between what he terms uh, the first and the last man. Uh, the first man being someone outside the globalized international economic system and the last man being those who prosper from the globalized economy. And uh, while he might not have been successful as projecting how our international system has developed, sorry, it's at least a very interesting analogy to uh, project on uh, continental, as a con continental uh, analogy. Because what we are seeing, as Sven is saying, is you have a Europe where you are, have a division between your first and the last man. You have those of us who wear suits and go to uh, universities and prosper in an integrated European economy. And you have the others who do not. And these are the people who are, through voting, seeking to uh, return to the nation state, to the national economy. Mm -hmm. And as a member of uh, the European Parliament and as an economist, on the European level, what type of policies can be developed to secure mm -hmm. a decent life? Because that's what we're talking about. A decent life for those who are Europeans, but will not work in investment banks. Those who are part of what, for fi uh, what they who worked in what was an in industrial sector 50 years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. What type of lives mm -hmm. can we provide these people? And how should the EU be a part of the solution? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Per. So another comment or question from Michael, also Future Lab. My name is Michał Golczyński. I come from Poland and I'm a Future Lab. Uh, I have a question to Mr. Giegold and um, maybe... Still Sven here. Uh, to uh, Andras, who wrote the first uh, chapter, because you both support uh, the idea of politicizing the uh, European public sphere. And on the other hand, you said that in order, uh, when we want the, demo the democracy to work, we need some level of equality, social equality. But you know that the inequality in Europe is incredible between uh, Romania and Bulgaria and uh, Germany and U or UK. And you know that it won't change in uh, 5, 10, 20 years. So how you can combine both these both contradictory ideas of having common democracy and having common uh, inequality. Okay, thank you. And there was a question from the from the lady, yeah? <laughs> um, hi, I'm Janice Thompson from the ECI campaign. Uh, before my question, I just wanted to make a note about gender here, because you've only heard from men. So um, just always keep that in mind in terms of inclusiveness. Um, my question was related to the European Citizens Initiative and youth unemployment. So I actually, the bigger problem with the ECI is not that it's not well known, it, that it's been designed in a way that is neither usable nor impactful, to your point, Mr. Um, Giegold. And the European Parliament recently strongly uh, approved a report asking the Commission to make it more usable. The Commission's res response was to do absolutely nothing, to say we will do nothing. And they gave no explanation, and in a December meeting of the College of Commissioners, they said the ECI was used on divisive topics, on niche topics. But when you actually look at some of the topics, not the ones that have, have succeeded, but a lot of the others, they're dealing with really core issues of environment and especially youth employment, unemployment, where that comes in. 
For example, you had unconditional basic income that proposed a unique solution to the lack of jobs. You had Act for Growth about supporting women entrepreneurs who are big job creators in the EU. And you also had Simona's Fraternity 2020 that talked about the issue of paid traineeships so that less affluent youth can get the skills and job experience they need to get jobs. But yet the commission's response is, we don't want this at all. They're saying to the citizens and to youth, we don't want to hear your ideas. It's, you're too dangerous. So how do you respond to that sort of attitude where the commission isn't even willing to make this usable so we can get the ideas of youth, so we can mobilize youth? And another thing too, to Mr. Giegel, is the EC has really been used to mobilize and build social movements. It's, it's um, bringing new people into EU affairs and connecting people across borders. All ECIs do that. But yet the commission is saying, no, we don't want this. How are we supposed to move forward with that mm -hmm. attitude? Thank you. I sure. um, go back to the panelists now, because I see that there are some, a lot of questions. So. Um, so maybe, and Andras, because so one of the questions was also addressed to, to you. So please. Uh, hello, good morning, everybody. I'm Andras Schwerger. I'm, uh, I've written the chapter number two, uh, <laughs> uh, which is about the politicization of the European Union. Speaking the mic. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so first of all, um, I um, regarding the social divisions and the economic divisions and the problems that uh, those who are not really the winners or uh, think that they are not the winners of the membership membership uh, in the European Union are voting for those parties who are actually more likely to closing uh, borders, uh, building fences uh, and walls. Uh, mm, I guess uh, that uh, it's maybe true, and the politicization is not the solution uh, for these kind of challenges. The politicization uh, instead would grant the possibility to uh, the pro-European forces to being able to um, to taking their positions in these debates uh, against these political powers and uh, accepting the possibility First of all, accepting the possibility of, uh, of the conflicts on the European level. Second, uh, changing a little bit the, elector, uh, the electoral system. I mean, for example, enforcing the Spitzenkandidaten system and making uh, the president of the European Commission directly elected by uh, European citizens would grant uh, that kind of legitimacy that actually uh, make possible for uh, the EU leadership for the pro-European uh, pro parties actually uh, fighting their own fights against European, uh, European and EU skeptic powers. And uh, secondly, I mean, my second point, which is actually missing from, uh, from the publication, that uh, the social, I mean, I guess that the EU, there are no losers of the EU membership. Uh, uh, even the poor, uh, in the poorest classes, uh, they became a little bit, um, you know, uh, became uh, to enter in, into a, well, in a better situation than before. But they are not aware about it because the perception uh, actually missing from uh, the member states level. Why? Because the national political leadership says that the EU doesn't, uh, doesn't do anything, only uh, useless regulations upon us. Meanwhile, if the legitimacy would be higher, thanks for the di uh, different electoral uh, methods, and uh, uh, the EU leadership and the pro-European parties would stand for these values in the national political debates, then the perception of the every citizen will change as well. And I guess that if, for example, uh, Juncker says that, okay, hello, uh, my humble uh, Hungarian friends, uh, the situation is that we actually gave you a lot of funds and a lot of helps. So if you don't would like to build more walls or more, uh, more fences, then maybe you should, uh, you, you should consider these kind of uh, values at the next elections. And uh, 
of course, the politicization is not the solution for social divisions. Social divisions uh, are highly more complex issues, and I'm uh, a political scientist, so I'm not trying to resolve those. So actually, <laughs> I mean, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I leave this for the economist. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I guess that uh, that would be my suggestion regarding uh, my chapter. Thank you. Okay, to uh, sum, it, um, sum it all. So we have uh, one question on uh, how, so the role of the EU to address social uh, inequalities and the social divide. So what are the EU policies that can be uh, put in place? Then we have another question on, more specifically, on the ECI and the attitude of the, the Commission towards uh, the ECI. And then the one of uh, Michael on how to combine the two objectives, um, how to combine a pan-European democracy uh, while still having so a high level of inequality uh, uh, between uh, member states. So who would like to, to start? Yes, you want. Sven, please. Uh, well, I, I tried to make uh, three points on what you were saying. I think what, what has helped on the national level uh, to ensure a certain um, togetherness between those who were on the bright and the losing side of life, there was, of course, the creation of the welfare state. And, uh, and the creation of the welfare state is not only of giving money from the rich to the poor, but also to invest in common institutions which create chances and opportunities for those who are more in difficulty. So, and Europe, with its small budget, has already only done very little and was only done uh, able to do very little. It's, we have the regional funds, we have the social funds, we have the youth programs, but in comparison to the tension the common market creates, uh, we, this is very little in comparison to what member states have done with their social uh, systems. So what could be done? I think um, on the level, if the social divisions get larger, Europe has to contribute uh, to, to this togetherness. One, one issue which I think is, is critical is that uh, Europe has to enable all member states to tax those uh, who have gained. So, and at the moment we are doing the opposite. So we have tax competition, which makes it more difficult uh, to tax uh, transnational corporation and those with very high incomes. So uh, we need uh, at least a struggle on, a common, on, on elements of a common European tax system, which close the loopholes and make it possible and uh, obligatory that uh, capital and in particular large ca transnational corporations and those on high incomes are effectively taxed. And if, that, if we move to these elements of a common European tax systems, all member states have more income uh, in order to, to invest in education, invest in future jobs and also compensate uh, with social systems, those who are losing. I also think that in particular, the Eurozone needs a larger budget. Uh, a larger budget, uh, a common European budget, concentrating on investment in future uh, sectors in those regions who are in difficulty. And these sort of ideas, if they would be realized, I think they would help also to stabilize European democracy. And this link only was my criticism, my humble criticism uh, to, to the political scientist as an economist. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, I would say I disagree with this uh, idea. Everybody has profited from Europe. Uh, I'm a, a, a pro-European by heart. And I, but I think it is very important that we as pro-Europeans reflect self-critically on that. Because if you speak uh, to, say, a French, um, a French working class uh, person, now m the strongest party uh, with the French voting cla working class is the Front National. So uh, why? Are they all stupid? I think they are not stupid. I think they feel that their wages were not developing with those with high education and that they are now competing with many people who came into the country and also with the global uh, uh, part of the working class who has less uh, uh, education and uh, 
to bring uh, to the negotiation table. So they are uh, worse off, and they are in particular relatively worse, the worse off. But uh, the feeling whether you are happy or not is not so much based how much wealth you have, but how much wealth you have in comparison to others. We are social beings. We are not unhappy because we don't have a luxus car, but we are unhappy if we don't have one which our neighbor has. Uh, this we might not like, but that is a bit how we as social beings function. And, uh, and therefore, I think we should, we should recognize that the tougher competition has led to more di di uh, divisions in our societies and that we should address them with the sort of measures, as I said. I don't say they can ever go away, because with freedom, there's also uh, there are also differences, which is belongs to each other, so we will not overcome uh, the differences, but we can limit the inequalities. And, uh, and with East and West, I'm not, it's interesting to see that at the moment the support for the European project is bigger in Eastern Europe than in many of the old member states. I find that really staggering in the Eurobarometer data. So the problem seems not so much to be that Romania wants to leave the European Union, but the, n the number of people who are unhappy about Europe is increasing in Italy, uh, in France, in Belgium, in Spain, in, uh, in Germany, even in Germany. And, and that is what uh, is, therefore, I don't see on that level the east-west uh, difference uh, such so much a problem. If I come to Eastern Europe, I see again the same division. In the capital regions, well-educated young people, they love Europe. They are in, <laughs> in tune with Europe, like you, like you. But uh, if you go to the eastern part of, uh, to I the closer to the Russian border in Poland, in Latvia, I in Slovakia, then you see lots of old, older people, people who feel very close, uh, far away from Brussels, and who feel they have been totally forgotten. So again, also in these countries, you have a strong social division, and, and people who feel they profited and uh, they didn't profit uh, from the integration project. While the common democracy with Romania seems to me much less of a problem. So uh, I. I'm a skeptic that the East-West holds so much. Uh, in a certain way, the divisions uh, are, um, well, have made us more similar uh, in the different uh, parts of Europe. So that is, uh, we, are, we are united in, uh, in this growing uh, 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 division. That is uh, how I see it. Okay, thank you. Um, Antonio, do you want to pick up okay. some of the points? Yeah, well, probably to, 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 to tell you some figures that I, uh, we have on who has participated in 2014 mm -hmm. amongst uh, the young generation. We have, well, if we compare this with the 26 million or the 90 million young people, is not, is nothing. But nevertheless, we had 234 young people moving, uh, so, sorry, three, 234 thousand young people moving around Europe on the youth movement, either on mobility or young people or participating in events or making uh, volunteering activities or uh, so this it's not enough but this demonst demonstrates that really we are moving towards a more equal uh, opportunity for under Erasmus, because this is outside the, the, the higher education mobility, the, the mobility made under the traditional Erasmus uh, 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 perspective. These are young people that outside of the sometimes outside of the school or under uh, uh, other, other opportunities. And this represents 6,000 different projects around Europe, which is very much important, because this demonstrates that Something is happening. Probably not enough. Uh, we assist of m more people are moving around, but we have still more problems. We have still not very inclusive uh, uh, society. So we have to reinforce our commitment on making this kind of uh, uh, projects and initiatives stronger and more, more, more uh, strategic important for the young people. 
Uh, may I ask you to answer what Simona and the ECI campaigner said I because they were addressed as commission and uh, yeah, but I apologize I have no mm. feedback for that. Simona do you want to jump in on uh, this point? Yeah, uh, I fully agree with Janice on his statement about uh, European citizens initiatives and also I, I found that your insights were very useful as well for our future advocacy regarding the citizens initiatives. My reaction would be that uh, the Commission shouldn't ignore citizens' I initiatives and citizens because as I see citizens' initiatives not just you sign and it's over. Because for many, it's also about the digital participation. 60% of signatures, they were online. And many of people who organized citizens' initiatives or who had intentions to launch a citizens' initiative, it was also, as Janice mentioned, cross-border cooperation. Some of them, they establish uh, small NGOs, movements, campaigns. So it's also about citizens' empowerment, empowerment of young people. It's also involved some people from disadvantaged background, from disconnected areas, because some issues were very relevant to certain countries or certain regions. And as Tony mentioned, I also agree that um, uh, the financement and funding should focus more on long-term um, projects, initiatives, campaigns, because it cre creates a bigger impact and it empowers more people, for example, like voluntary service. I participated myself and, and I know also from the study uh, by the European Commission that if you take somebody from disadvantaged background, the impact is huge. And if you take somebody who already has to master degrees from Oxbridge universities, who traveled to the US, of course, the impact is really very small because for these people, it's something that I come to the event, I had a drink with people that I already know, and I feel good. But if you give this opportunity for peop people from uh, non-capital cities, from minorities particularly, young women, also refugees, immigrants, you would see that really it can contribute to economy, to participatory democracy, and it would be a long-term commitment. Because what sometimes people need is this a small push from side that they can get uh, empowered and enabled. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I may add something here, 35 percent of the mobility made in 2014 were from disadvantaged young people. So 35 percent, which is, well, it's not, it might be better, but it's already a huge amount. This means that the, ON, the NGOs that really propose this kind of activities pay attention to bringing people from disadvantaged areas to this process. Okay. I think I will take three more points from the, from the future labors because we only have 10 more minutes. So there is uh, Franz who would like to intervene. Thank you very much. My name is Franz Almeyer, and I authored the uh, part of technology from our publication. And um, thank you for everybody's input. I just want to summarize it and kind of bring it to context. Uh, we talk about youth unemployment, we talk about healthcare, we talk about all these things that are happening. But just to put into context what's happened in the last week, if you see the, the Panama Papers, if you, there was articles that said, if you tax 10% of that money that is actually hoarded in the tax havens right now, you would have enough money to fund universal basic income for the entire population, universal healthcare for the entire population of the world, and universal uh, education for elementary and university. So just to put it into perspective, let that sink in for a little bit. And then it kind of comes to me when we talk about politics, it's kind of ultimately a decoy about what we're what actually the real problem is. So somehow government has kind of been used as a tool to as we mentioned about the lobbyists and all that, so that's ultimately taken away and there's a misalignment in terms of what the people are demanding and needing. And to me, technology is, um, is a way to bring people together to shift that power back to society and enable us to fight for our common good because obviously uh, the political spectrum is failing at it and there's a lot of uh, flaws in there that we need to resolve. And, uh, it has to go both ways from the government, but also from civil society to, to wake up from this and realign and use the tools of, of the digital and internet technology to fight back against this and to make a stance. Thank you, Franz. There is one question from uh, Masida. 
and another one, I will take another one from Lucas. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor and thank you for the excellent panel and the input so far. Uh, my name is Marisida Bandili. I'm a former Future Lab uh, Euro participant, and actually, I have a question directed to Mr. Isvan, the member of the European <laughs> Parliament. Um, we are talking nowadays about uh, the fact that young people are the future of Europe. I've heard this statement in so many events that I've participated in the last years. And um, how, how does it really coincide with the reality? If we do a reality check right now, how much are young people contributing to the European political sphere? If you look at the last elections of the European Parliament, it's only less than 2% of, of the representatives that are young, if we take the margin of uh, 20 to 40 uh, years old. And um, I wrote an article in 2014 saying that we have a new parliament, so we have, uh, uh, we have old, old faces, but we have new members. So meaning that there is the same people everywhere in, the, in politics. And so how are young people contributing to decision-making processes at the European Parliament where the decisions making, uh, that are made uh, for them are made without them being there? And what, what kind of input, how can we change that in order to improve young people's representation at the parliament? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And last question from Lukas. Thank you. My name is Lukas Brück. Um, I'm also a future lover. I have two questions, one for uh, Silva Mendes. You were mentioning traveling within Europe doesn't, um, is a good thing and having uh, exchange between different people. My question is, um, I doubt that just traveling within Europe established trust into the EU democracy. Maybe I have friends all over Europe, but that doesn't necessarily help me to trust into the European Union or into EU institutions. So how does this work for you that just because I'm traveling all over Europe, I have friends in France, in the UK or in Poland, how do you, how does it help me or how do you establish trust in, in EU institutions? And at the same token, uh, my question for both of you, um, you were speaking about different tools to participative democracy, like the citizen, uh, citizenship, uh, but, uh, citizenship it, uh, initiative on water, which was basically not um, followed through, or the referendum now in the Netherlands, uh, where uh, Juncker, the only thing Juncker said about it is, uh, I'm sad about the out outcome. So. It was a proxy election for sure. It was not just on Ukraine, but nevertheless, having um, just the answer of I'm sad about, or as your colleague Miss Harms said that she was criticizing the referendum idea as a whole. Um, so I'm wondering if we give people or the European people uh, tools to participate, but then we're not listening to what they have to say, then maybe it's even worse than not giving them the tools because it might be even alienate them more as they are ready to the European Union. Thank you. So thank you for all these very interesting uh, questions. So we go back to, um, to the panelists and I would also ask Ivo and Simona to come up with maybe one key policy recommendation or one key message for our policymakers. But first I start with you, um, Antonio. Uh, when I talk uh, traveling is not traveling by traveling, is not uh, tourism. When I talk about traveling is under Erasmus uh, uh, initiative or under use uh, uh, volunteering is participating in a transborder uh, initiative. <coughs> uh, this can have two main impacts, I believe. One helps the people that are going on mobility to create more competencies uh, on adaptation on different areas, languages, and so on, and can also be very important for individual employability. At the same time, if we realize that this is under the European institution's umbrella, this can create some sort of I will not say recognition, but involvement. And the fact that you are having a European, uh, you have friends all over Europe, your virus in terms of European uh, approach can, 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 can increase. So in that extent, 
mobility can be a very useful instrument, not only for the individual uh, increase of competencies, uh, in terms of increase your employability, but increase your active participation. Uh, but what is active participation for you? Sorry? What is active participation? Then? Active participation is you are involved in the society. You are involved in uh, the common goal. You are participating in helping uh, inclusive people or helping society for growing, participating in sports activity for all. Uh, it can be a lot of things. It depends on what is your willing to participate. If you have your agenda, your own agenda, first, second, and third, or if you have the common agenda at a certain point in your personal agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Sven, maybe also on the parliament and the representation of young people um, in the European Parliament? So, um, at least, uh, first I would like to say that I think young people, they profit from more participation if there's more participation for all. I didn't do any, and I said it in the beginning, any of these calls uh, young people have to bear now uh, also the, the, to carry the back of the missing participatory level in Europe. Uh, I think that's a, a problem which is across the board, which is not uh, specific for young people and not young people are the solution. And so on this rhetoric, I didn't follow because I feel it, it's too cheap. Yeah? So exactly what you were saying, what you have listened so often, at least I think today, no one of us uh, had that rhetoric. So, and I think that is uh, already a start. So. Uh, I, second, uh, I can only say that uh, whether young people are participating in power depends very much on fights inside of the different components of power. So I can tell that for my own party. Uh, when we were running uh, last time, we had three people under 35, one below 30 of 11 people who got elected to the European Parliament. So we are clearly, the German Greens, we are clearly one of the younger uh, um, uh, delegations. And of course it is uh, clear that it's not normal to be elected to a parliament when you are 18. You are elected when you have done a certain way of education and experience. But at least we, in our party, the young people won the struggle to get on the lists. <coughs> and, uh, and why did they win it? Because they were organized with the young Greens and the young Greens they fight with uh, some of the olders, like myself, in order to get on the list. And they win because in the party there is a certain receptiveness. So your young people have to organize and then fight for their share of power. And that is basically my recurrent message. It, power will never be given away. It has always been uh, uh, conquered. And that is also true for your generation. You will have to fight with the older generation. And, uh, and that is part of democracy. And, uh, that, and, and me, as someone who has a responsibility in my party, and it's well known, I was always in favor opening the gates of power towards the young. And, uh, and that is something I support. And, uh, but also young people should measure uh, uh, pe older people whether they are willing to share power or whether they are unwilling. And you should expose those who are unwilling. So this is the sort of, uh, uh, of way, I think, how to deal with that. And then I would I answer, like to answer to Lucas. Uh, first, uh, the water initiative, in a certain way, was one of the initiatives which had a real-world consequence. At least they got a part of their uh, uh, demands. Many others of the initiatives got nothing. And I agree with your criticism and your criticism with the Commission that they were not taking seriously these initiatives. And people will not, will not participate if they don't feel the participation has an effect. Mm -hmm. I understand you cannot comment because it's not your responsibility. But Mr. Juncker, Mr. Timmermans, I think they should be ashamed. They should be ashamed because they are not using the voices of the people to re-legitimize the European project. Even if they don't always disagree, uh, agree, they should at least 
um, show that they take it truly seriously. Of course, if one million people sign something, it doesn't give them the right to determine policy. That would be very unjust towards the other 500 million, but it should be really having an effect that the decision-making system reflects. And when you look to TTIP, you were saying it, 3.5 million people signed, and what is the system doing? It is, ba in particular, in the Commission, I do not see that they have understood the lesson, why so many people are skeptical. They haven't understood it. So, and uh, lastly, point on this, uh, to come back to Lucas, <coughs> the Netherlands a referendum against Ukraine. Well, what some people there did was really cheap and bad mm. because they misused a national referendum to kill the future of a whole country of 40 million people, a future inside of Europe. This is a shame and misuse of the possibility of a national referendum. I'm very clear on this. Not a be I'm in favor of direct democracy. I'm a member of More Democracy, which was the German association which has f led to the anchoring of the um, citizens' initiative in the current uh, European treaty. So I'm very much in favor of direct democracy and so on. But there are some criteria for legitimate di direct democracy. For instance, not uh, 15 million Dutch can decide for 500 million Europeans. I think there should be European direct democracy, but it should be then European-wide. We cannot allow that a referendum in one country determines for all of us whether we can have a treaty with Ukraine. Second, we have to make sure in the process that such a referendum is not uh, then misused in order to do uh, Dutch politics. <coughs> While we are deciding, de facto, they have decided about the future fate of young and old people in Ukraine. So therefore, this Ukraine referendum is, and there I disagree with Rebecca Harms, and I told her personally also, I disagree with all her general statements which were negative about de direct democracy. But I agree with her that uh, direct democracy, in order to be legitimate, uh, has to also follow certain principles. And that uh, includes, for instance, that the level where you take a decision, European, should be the level where you vote. And, uh, and that was really not uh, followed. And, uh, and that is a very important problem uh, now because uh, we will have to continue with the cooperation with Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, and I'm happy if Mr. Juncker finds a way to do it, even if uh, this referendum ended as it ended. Thank you. Um, so <coughs> Last uh, chance for Ivo and Simona maybe to um, give a last message to our uh, speakers. So how to revive democracy in Europe and how to change the, the face of democracy. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, yeah, the, I think the main thing for me, as if I speak as Ivo Visak or not representing the <laughs> whole future lab, uh, is the openness of this whole uh, European Union processes also, and how they are done and very much reflect on what uh, Vargas wrote on the whole ideas of making a lot of these council meetings more open, televising them or whatever else. The thing is that there's a con constant disconnect of feeling that why should I care? Why should I really care if there is like not really any knowledge on what's happening there? What are the weights on that measure, these uh, uh, decisions that are made? And uh, that's, that's, the, that's the point of the political lines that should be clear. Because uh, until we don't know why these decisions are made, it's very also very often a very big question of uh, why should I follow them through. So yeah, more openness. Thank you, Ivo. Simona? Uh, I also will speak uh, as myself, <laughs> as uh, Simona from Scute. Uh, so uh, my statement also would be a bit more political that uh, we should invest uh, in and provide a better support for both organized and non-organized civil society movements so that they, they can be an important vectors for making lively, direct and participatory democracy tools more accessible and efficient. Thank you. 
So to uh, conclude, because we are now reaching the end of, of our debate, so just I would like to go back to one um, to one point made, I think, by by Sven. So saying that we are in the middle of a crisis of uh, Western. Uh, democracies, and if we look at uh, what's happening across Europe, so it's very clear that there are some similar symptoms uh, emerging in all corners uh, of, of uh, Europe. So uh, symptoms of uh, social uh, anger, of uh, social uh, distress, and this is uh, a trend that very much transcends um, all national uh, national uh, borders. So we are uh, clearly in, a, in the middle of a crisis of um, also electoral and national uh, representative democracy. So I think that it very much uh, highlights the need also for finding some common solutions. So at the at the European level, to uh, maybe also back. Um, this movement for uh, pan-European uh, democracy. Um, so I think that, again, so the, the publication contains uh, very good ideas and uh, recommendations for that. Um, I will also encourage all of you uh, to take part in our social media campaign because the social media campaign will continue for uh, some weeks. So uh, if you also could spread the, the word to, you, to your colleagues and... Uh, to you, to your friends. So that will be great because also one of the key objectives of the campaign is to go beyond Future Lab and the Future Lab uh, Europe program. So really to try to reach out to, as we discussed, also uh, young people who are not used to be part of the decision-making process and who are not used to raise their voice. So you can follow us on um, on our uh, Twitter account and our on, on our Facebook uh, page, and we'll continue to use the hashtag #IParticipate. So thank you very much uh, to all of you for all the very interesting questions and the very nice uh, inputs. Uh, thank you to Ivo and Simona for uh, being part of the panel, and um, also. Uh, to our two speakers, so Antonio and Sven, for taking the time to uh, be with us this morning. Thank you. Yep.